Right. Congressman Banks, wonderful to have you here. Yeah, great to be here. So I know that something that's very important to you is na the issue of national security. And actually, we, in our uh, interviews, we haven't been covering this much. This is a great opportunity to dive right into that. Well, uh, first and foremost, it's great to be with you and great to be at CPAC. Once again, the energy here every time I come is, is incredible to know that there are conservatives from all over the country that come and visit the nation's capital once a year and talk about uh, conservative values. Uh, Unbelievable. There, there, yeah. there's, there's a lot to be excited about uh, right now with under President Trump's leadership, um, what this Congress has done with this president to, on a lot of notes, but I, I believe nowhere more important than on national security, national defense. What, what President Trump has done to, to uh, boost defense spending is unparalleled at, at no other point um, since uh, Ronald Reagan's military buildup in 1981. It's a lot, it looks a lot like that. Uh, a number of parallels, um, and, and, and the president deserves almost all the credit for it, working with the Congress and demanding Congress come up with spending deals that boost uh, defense spending. And why is this important at this time, in particular, in your mind? Well, it, it, it doesn't take much to look uh, around the world and realize how, how tumultuous of a security environment uh, we face today, whether it's uh, Russia and China, whether it's the ongoing conflicts and um, issues in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, whether it's it's what's on the on the horizon uh, that we don't know about uh, the continued rise of of um, radical Islamic uh, uh, terrorism as well around the world. So there, there's much on our plate, uh, and there and there's much at stake uh, as we as we head into the 2020 election cycle. Um, the the juxtaposition between more of what President Trump has brought with increased defense spending and a tougher posture abroad versus what we saw during the eight years of the Obama administration. That, that's what's on the ballot in 2020. And I, oh. I just got back last week from the Munich Security Conference. Right. Uh, Pre uh, Vice President Pence spoke. spoke. A lot of attention was drawn to the lack of applause in the room. I was in the room, and, 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 and that's right. Uh, the, president, the, the Vice President's tough love message to our European allies uh, didn't draw a lot of applause. Um, but it was the right message. We, we demand that our allies step up and join us in meeting uh, uh, the 2% GDP uh, NATO goals for their countries to keep their countries safe. Right. Compare that to what happened the very next day. The vice president spoke, tough love message. The next day, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden spoke. We, we expect to get into the race. He'll be a front runner if he does. He talked about how embarrassed he was of America. It, it reminded me in that moment and because I was there, it reminded me of the, uh, the the President Obama apology tour around the world, apologizing for America. So you, you, you look at the difference between those two speeches, that's what's on the ballot in 2020. More more of what we got with, with Trump and Pence in a tough posture, or or go back to the the failed Obama policies over those eight years. And I, I, know, I know what I, I want more of, and I think I know what the American people want more of. And, the, the 2020 election is going to, going to determine that. So where do you see the kind of biggest strategic threats for America right now? I, I, I don't think it's anywhere um, more seen than with, with the rapid rise of China, uh, whether it's um, their, 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 mil, their, their uh, na naval buildup, uh, their efforts in the South China Sea, uh, whether Land it's the, masses. <laughs> right, I mean, whether it's the long-term strategic efforts of China uh, and the, the Trojan horse of China in the in developing the 5G network and implementing oh, okay. uh, their technologies um, abroad and the, even the fight in the United States of America where they are bringing their technologies here that are used for as tools of uh, economic and, and security espionage efforts. So on the, lo the long-term threat I see uh, is China and and whether or not America is going to confront that threat as President Trump has confronted it in a way that we haven't seen before. I mean, all all of the the uh, efforts by this president with sanctions and uh, the the tariffs and and uh, uh, all of the tools that he's used uh, to go after China. It's all it's all in, uh, by nature. Uh, related to the long-term threat that we face with China. And that's where I, I applaud the president's efforts greatly. Well, so a number of people have argued, uh, including many of our columnists for over a decade, actually, that these some of the ways that China has been, for example, this, uh, you know, rampant IP theft, and essentially, you know, some people have estimated at trillions of dollars per year in, in, in IP theft, you know, basically uh, cyber attacks, um, 
it's almost the, the term Cold War has been brandished about a lot of these methods, even economic methods, um, you know, the, the holding the currency at a certain level. Um, have, been, have been described as a type of warfare, asymmetrical warfare. Is that how, how do you see that? Well, I, I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, it's it's uh, technologies like Huawei. Again, getting back to the five G discussion uh, and the, and, the, and President Trump's efforts to put pressure on our allies abroad not to adopt um, Huawei as a, as a five G solution. Um, th those are, that's the type of strategic thinking we've had under President Trump that we haven't had. Uh, before in an American president and confronting the Chinese threat, but it's 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 IP theft. It's um, it's the nature of some activities by uh, the Confucius Institutes and and right. some of those efforts on college campuses to normalize their behavior. Uh, we're we're seeing a lot more of that on the rise. We can either turn a blind eye like former presidents have, or we can uh, praise the president's uh, approach of, of putting pressure and getting tough on China, which, as a member of Congress, I think is that's the direction that we need to go. Very interesting. And so what do you make of President Trump walking away from the table in, in Vietnam a couple of days ago? Well, at, at the end of the day, the, uh, uh, walking away and, and not having any deal is better than a bad deal. And I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of Kim Jong-un um, and, and, and North Korea and in any commitments that they have made, will make. Um, so I, I'm, 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 I'm frankly glad the president walked away and, and, uh, and, and didn't. Um, you know, overextend himself and, and agreeing to a deal that we would later regret. Uh, that, that being said, where we are today compared to where we were 18 months ago is is stark. Um, 18 months ago, we were talking about North Korea launching intercontinental ballistic missile tests. We were. Um, each time they did it, those those uh, intercontinental intercontinental ballistic missiles were growing in uh, in better technologies, capacities. Um, they, they were getting better at what they were doing. We're not talking about that anymore, and it's because of President Trump's diplomatic efforts. Um, they're, they're far from over. I mean, we, we've been here before with summits being organized right. and called off, summits that occurred with, with the president walking away from, from bad deals. This has got a long ways to go, but I, I assure you that we're a lot better off today than we were 18 months ago. So, you know, we've discussed this piece a little bit with some other folks uh, here, but, you know, I, I'm sure it wasn't just Kim Jong-un uh, in Asia that noticed that President Trump walked away from the table as he did. I think Mr. Xi Jinping also noticed. Do you care to comment on that? No, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, the, the rest of the world knows today that they're dealing with an American president who's tough, um, who who's not afraid to to, uh, to, to walk away and, and in situations like these. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a negotiation tactic that they're dealing with that they, they've never dealt with before. I mean, they dealt with a very weak uh, a president and Obama um, that, that was so so different than than what this president is capable of, and that that shapes not just negotiations with North Korea, but it, it also shapes negotiations with with China, with Russia, uh, with other uh, adversaries and allies that we deal with on a regular basis too. This president is um, is, is certainly uh, unique in his approach to negotiation, and, and that that's that's one of the many reasons that he was elected, and I, I believe the American people stand with him and and being, being tough in situations like these. So so you're saying is this unorthodox negotiation strategy, at least, by, let's say, by political standards, is, is working? Uh, I, I believe so, but only time will tell. But I, I gotta tell you, as I said a moment ago, uh, the times have changed. If you, if, you, if you just go back 18 months ago and compare that uh, to where we are today, uh, in, in so many ways. You, you look at, even look at uh, the, the, the new NAFTA agreement, uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement um, and how that was negotiated with the, with those two countries, um, they were dealing with a different type of American president that brought them to the table and brought them to agreements on on trade issues that they probably wouldn't have agreed to before. But they did that because they knew they were dealing with a president that could could back away or or negate um, something that they wanted, and uh, th those negotiations ha have worked to our benefit under President Trump in a way that we haven't seen uh, before, or at least in a long time. Well, and, and NATO, you know, suddenly we were actually seeing the NATO countries actually anting up to what they're supposed to deliver, right? Yes. I, I, again, I was at the Munich Security Conference. We met with the Secretary General Stoltenberg, and he talked about he talked about exactly that. I mean, they they have benefited from President Trump's efforts to demand that our European allies step up to the plate, spend more. That means NATO has more resources 
to do the important work that they do. So they, they, they concede, even, even NATO leadership concedes that they've benefited from this president's approach. Fantastic. Well, such a pleasure to speak with you, Congressman Likewise. Banks. Likewise. Great to be with you.